Now then, Douglas McMaster reporting from the infamous River Cottage. We're here to meet the white knight of sustainability. Hugh Fernley Whittingstall isn't an actual knight, but he deserves to be knighted for the ceaseless campaigning against the corruption of our food industry. From big fish to plastic pollution, he is fearless in the face of these industrial tyrants and is a constant source of inspiration for me and this channel. Before I lose my composure, let's go meet Hugh. Hey, you? Doug, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, very good. Welcome back to River Cottage. I'm here and so is spring. It so, certainly is, isn't it? I've seen a few nettles on the way. It's a perfect time for a spring forage. There's lovely wild greens popping up everywhere. And I've got my foraging basket. Yep, let's do it. Should we head over this way? I'm, I'm sure we're going to have some goodies over here. So, Doug, this is a good spot for nettles just along the wall underneath the cookery school here. Everybody should make nettle soup. Yeah. My theory is that wherever you live you're never more than five minutes walk from a patch of nettles. Yeah. The nettle is the point of entry yeah. because it's so abundant and so nutritious and properly delicious. Yeah. Has your like consumption of meat changed over the years? Yes it absolutely has. I couldn't promise you that I will be eating meat 10 years from now. Yeah. I hope I will still feel that there are, you know, that there is a, a place for sustainable yeah. meat. Many chefs who are thinking about this week just cannot go on putting meat front and centre. We are still omnivores here at River Cottage, but mm. we've completely recalibrated so that meat really is the treat. The distinction that I see and, and make is that it's the industrialization of, of these food systems which is the problem and that is where waste exists, that is where food becomes a commodity and they start doing insane things like, you know, sticking thousands of cows in a shed and feeding it something that it was never meant to eat and that's, that's where it goes wrong. I, I, I completely agree. Moved away from London, you've created this incredible self-sufficient food system, and it's just really the gold standard. But then you work so heavily with the opposite end of the spectrum with supermarkets. Have you managed that relationship over the years? You know, having such an ideal and working with something that's not ideal. Supermarkets are not going to go away anytime soon. We might, we might wish that they would, but it just isn't going to happen. Absolutely. So we need a dialogue. You know, yeah. we need to be able to work with big farming and with big retail and the biggest reward you can give a supermarket as a customer is to buy their product and if you don't like what they're doing the biggest punishment you can give them is not to buy it. Every pound you spend in a supermarket or anywhere is a vote for the system that produces that particular food. The important thing is how do you source most of what you do, what's the mainstay of your kitchen and if it's seasonal and local that's great. If it's organic too, I think that's a, a, a really good way to go because when you buy organic food, you know that you're, you're putting a vote for, for healthy soils and, and more and more that's an important thing to bear in mind. Brilliant. So this is the kitchen garden, Doug. Oh wow, beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's early days in this year and we've mm. got uh, a lot of growing still to do but you've, you've got a lot of seedlings in now yeah. you can see and we tend to go for this no dig approach yes with very narrow beds so you can mm. reach them from either side you don't compact the soil mm. and that's brilliant for all the microbial soil activity soil is actually if we look after it has almost everything we need to grow food and we don't need all these inputs and that means not compacting it and if we can avoid it not plowing it at all yeah so yeah. that's, uh, that's yeah, yeah. the big conversation at the moment how has the reception been to to all of the work that you've done you know we've we've picked up a few issues to uh, champion or, or challenge down the years including intensive farming, particularly chicken farming. The most important thing is that things don't happen in secret. So if we are going to have intensive agriculture, it needs to be transparent. And if there is going to be food, fish wasted out at sea, we need to shine a light on it. Yeah. For me, the, the most important thing is to 
drag these things into the public consciousness, start a, a proper debate about them, and let's go from there. Because for, for far too long, nobody really knew what was going inside a chicken shed, and nobody understood that hundreds of thousands of, of tons of fish was being wasted out at sea. We've turned it into a political issue, mm. and it's out there. And then the other thing is, if the public understands about that, that can inform their choices. Yeah. I saw um, the documentary with the BBC where you went and investigated the recycling in Malaysia and you, uh, you described it as a plastic planet. How have you dealt with this issue of plastic since seeing that? There we were challenging, again, one of the things that was kind of like a dirty secret of the industry, yeah. which was that huge amounts of our plastic waste were being exported overseas. The argument was, well, they've got uh, you know, an economy that recycles more cheaply than we do here in the UK. So for them, it's a commodity. We'll send it out to China, Malaysia, Turkey. Uh, we'll make our, our plastic problem a resource for them. Yeah. The problem is it became a dumping ground for a lot of plastics that were not actually being recycled at all. And then yeah. were sitting in these huge piles, causing huge problems for people locally. That has resulted in legislation, often in those countries themselves, banning the import of European plastic, which is a good thing because it puts the focus back on us to deal with our own plastics. Simply by refusing it, whether you choose to not buy um, vegetables wrapped in plastic in the supermarket, that itself is a vote. You know, yes, you're voting. And, and, and it's a good one. But one of the again, we, one of the things we highlighted in the show, which is a kind of madness, is that some of the uh, supermarkets are selling a slowly growing range of good produce that's not wrapped in plastic. It tends to be more expensive than the stuff wrapped in plastic. It's got to be more economical for your customer to do the right thing than the wrong thing, or you're not doing the right thing as a retailer. How can that perspective of sustainability grow within, within the food system? As well as the conversation, we need to put the practicalities out there as well, you know, and, and which, you, which you do a lot. You know, some great recipes for, for ferment and other things using vegetable trim, uh, stuff that's kind of the bread and butter of silo. If you're hospitality and you can turn the food that used to go in your bin into a, something you can sell to your customer with a great story, yeah. that's good economics. Yeah. That story can be about where the food came from, yeah. but it can also be about how you stopped it being wasted. It's an equally good story, sometimes yeah. an even better one. Yeah. So creating a story around it and getting people excited about that story uh, is a huge part of spreading the word. <laughs> You ready to rustle up a super simple nettle soup? I am. I'm very excited about this recipe. So we can just chop up these veg. Yep. And, and uh, skin on. Skin on everything except the onions. Uh, here at River Cottage, the onion skins will go in our compost. But yeah. have you found uh, have you found a way to make that actually edible, consumable? We make a, an onion skin treacle, and you just basically make a stock, and then you reduce that down. Now you want to introduce something with high sugar, so some other veg like carrots into that stock, and then when you reduce it, you get a good yield because of the sugar, but then you get the flavor of the onion skins. So particularly if you toast the onion skins, uh, big, deep umami, sort of robust, yeah. savory flavors is an extraordinary condiment, and it sits mm. in your fridge forever. It's almost like an onion marmite, would yes. that be a, a fair yes. description? Yeah, exactly that, it's an onion marmite. So I'm just going to throw a knob of butter in there, I'm going to be quite generous with that, a little bit of creaminess. All the root veg and the onion can go in, yep. and we'll just keep an eye on that, let it sizzle and sweat until the onions start to get tender. I'm just going to shred these very fine like yeah. chives. Nice. Cube. What's the worst kind of waste? When we were filming our, our series on waste, I was amazed to find out that actually a lot of people who think that the minute something gets to the use by date, you've got to throw it away. That yeah, is yeah. almost the law. Do you want to give that a little stir? Absolutely. It's amazing when you when you cook with the with the average uh, home cook, the fear about that sell by date, the fear, the, the emotional response they get is like disgust. Yeah, and that's yeah. really powerful. We've lost that ability to use our own senses yeah, yeah. to tell us when food is good or not. 
Hugh, you've done so much work creating awareness in the food industry. What next needs your attention or, or, or my attention? This issue of food production and climate and food production and biodiversity. We cannot grow food at the expense of the entire planet, you know, because if, if we have planetary failure, we have complete food failure as well. It's tricky because in some ways, I think you can get people exercised more about the specifics like animal welfare or the problem of waste uh, than you can about that scary big picture yeah. climate. Thing. Yeah. But we do need to make that second nature in the way that we talk about food and farming. Climate and biodiversity has to come in at the beginning, not as an afterthought. Do you think food and uh, cooking and growing food should be more uh, central to a young person's education? Absolutely. I, I, I can think of few things in our discussion today that are more important than that. People need to be food literate. That means understanding what healthy food is and how you, how you eat well to look after your body. If people understood that the fundamentals of good eating are, are, is the world of plants, mostly gathered in season from as close to where you are as possible, yeah. and that you don't need a, 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 you know, crazy amounts of knife skills or kind of deep food education to be able to turn yeah. those plants yeah. into a really delicious, nutritious food. few little extra nuts of butter yeah just enrich it and here's something I sometimes do just a sprinkle of oats just a tiny bit it's just to give it a little silkiness yeah and also help emulsify it yeah exactly bring it together Good to go. Ready for a bowl of nettle soup? I'm definitely ready. Got a nice little wait. garnish for you? It really does look stunning. This olive oil is a slightly exotic finish, Doug, but it is shipped by sale, so it's got a nice backstory. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Thank you Tuck so in. much. It for... be hot. Yeah. But I don't think it will sting you now. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is stunning. So people think maybe nettles are going to taste somehow harsh or but actually they've just got this really full mm. green taste and it's just goodness. Yeah, it feels like spinach and peas like had a baby, you know. It's, That's a it's, really good description because there mm. is natural sweetness in there. Yeah. Plus a little bit of sweetness from the carrot too, but a mm. lot of that's coming from the nettles themselves. Yeah, stunning. I feel revitalized, regenerated even. Regenerated. <laughs> I'll stick to that. <laughs> Thank you. What a pleasure to have you back at River Cottage. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, I just want to say thank you so much for the endless inspiration and motivation and um, thank you for everything you do. It's a pleasure, Doug, and thanks for, for everything you're doing too. It's fantastic. We go for a lot today. Let's have a big hug. Great right. to chew the fat. Yeah. And slurp the soup. <laughs> Until next time. Until next time. Cheers. Yeah.